Posts announcing departure from the Christian faith fill your timeline. How and why did I leave the faith? You're sent another YouTube video of an influencer detailing their faith deconstruction. Publicly disassociated myself from the church. That friend, that family member who seemed to follow Jesus so vibrantly is now in the midst of a crisis of faith. What should we make of our moment? Well, first, we need to create space for asking hard questions, recognizing that asking questions does not equal lack of faith, and that unbelief is not the inevitable end of deconstruction. In fact, deconstructing can be the road toward reconstructing a more mature, robust faith that grapples honestly with the deepest questions of life. So let's talk about what troubles us, address what hurts us, acknowledge what we got wrong, and do the hard work of discerning what is and is not real Christianity. Most of all, let's focus on Jesus and constructing beautiful faith. Thought we'd start off with some humor this morning. <laughs> um, out of the mouth of babes, right? It's... Uh, I love these two brothers because I think they highlight for us kind of the two kinds of people when it comes to the subject of politics. Uh, there's the people who um, are like that first little boy, right? Who just, they hear the word politics and you just want to scream, right? And then there's the other brother who like is way too into politics, right? He just wants to bring it up at every conversation. And uh, maybe there's some of you who are somewhere in the middle of all that, but um, uh, Thanksgiving is next week. And there's two things you're not supposed to bring up at Thanksgiving dinner, and they are religion and politics. Uh, because a fight might break out, right? You need Uncle Ralph to get along with Cousin Felicity. Like, they have to get along. And so you don't want a fight to break out, so we're going to fight at church. That's what we figured we'd do. So we're going to talk about both of these subjects uh, today in this topic of political idolatry. It's, it, it's also election season, both here in Canada, as well as our neighbors to the south. And be honest, you're probably watching more U.S. politics than Canadian politics. I'm sure some of us are, at least. Uh, we're, we're going through this series, though, called Constructing Beautiful Faith. And we're tackling this issue because this is an issue that has come up when it comes to the um, larger issue of deconstruction, faith deconstruction. So um, just to bring you up to speed, if you haven't been here uh, for this series, we've been looking at a number of different issues of uh, reasons people have given for why they are deconstructing uh, their Christian faith, or sometimes leaving church, or sometimes uh, deconverting altogether, like leaving the faith altogether. Uh, we've been living in the midst of a time where there's been a lot of disillusionment people have with the church uh, for various reasons. And so uh, we've tackled a number of issues. Um, one is doubt, uh, making space for people who have doubts and are wrestling with doubts. Uh, church hurt, a uh, purity culture. We tackled that last week. Great message from Pastor Matt. You can go back and watch those messages on the website. Uh, you can also watch a, a great message Pastor Matt gave a number of years ago on politics if you want to uh, go even deeper after today. Uh, the heart of this series, though, is as your pastors, we really want uh, to kind of own where we've been wrong as a church, not just here at Central, but even as representatives of the larger body of Christ. Where have we strayed from Scripture? Where have we um, not made space for others who are wrestling? Where have we set up man-made laws? Where have we constructed our own idols, mixed them together with our faith in unhelpful ways? Political disagreement is one of the reasons that many people gave for de-churching and deconverting from faith. Leslie Newbigin uh, argued over 50 years ago that as Christendom fell across the Western world, that Christians must be on guard against a particular form of idolatry known as syncretism. That is the merging of one's belief in Jesus with a particular political ideology or philosophy so that it becomes a different thing entirely. Nubigen said this, quote, This confusion of a particular infallible set of political and moral judgments with the cause of Jesus Christ is more dangerous than the open, the open rejection of the claim of Christ in something like Islam. Because it uses the name of Jesus to cover the absolute claims of one national tradition. Nubijan uh, saw quite prophetically that there would be a vacuum that would be created 
as, as uh, Christendom fell in the Western world, as Christian culture kind of fell and secular culture kind of reigned over it. And he said, we must be on our guard against this kind of ideology mixing with our faith. As Christians, how can we be aware of political idolatry in, our, in ourselves and also in our churches? And how do we avoid uh, becoming that way? How do we do politics in a healthy way, in a beautiful way, in a way that Jesus, a Jesus way, we could say? Uh, what better place to look than to look at Jesus? I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 18, uh, verse 33 is where we're going to pick it up. And we're going to look at an interaction that Jesus had with one of the powerful political leaders of his day. It was a powerful political leader in the Roman Empire known as Pontius Pilate. And Jesus' words to Pilate in this encounter are going to serve, uh, serve to kind of get us on track here. So I invite you to stand uh, with me uh, for the reading of God's word. And as we hear this, these are words from our king. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? All right, have a seat, you guys. It's God's word. So here's where we're going to go uh, this morning. First, we're going to look at Jesus and the church and politics and the relationship uh, between those things. And then we're going to look at signs of political idolatry or what we could call worldly politics. And then thirdly, we'll look at constructing beautiful political engagement or what we could call otherworldly politics. So first, uh, Jesus, the church, and politics. What do we mean when we say the word politics? Um, a lot of times we use that word in a very negative sense. We talk about like uh, church politics or the politics of business or maybe we think about the political kind of theater and the 24-hour news cycle that we're inundated with. I appreciate Patrick Schreiner's definition in his book, Political Gospel. Here's how he defines it. He says, political simply means the activities associated with the organization and governance of people. It has to do with rulership and who has the right to order our lives. It is what happens in the public domain. To paraphrase Augustine, politics is people bound together by common loves. Politics comes from the Greek word polis, which means city, or politikia, meaning the affairs of the cities. Politics is simply how we partner together for the flourishing of humanity and the world. Christian politics concerns how we integrate our confession that Jesus is Lord with our call to love our neighbors. Very helpful. In our text this morning, uh, Jesus has been brought before political powers. He was arrested by the Jewish Sanhedrin, and now uh, they want Pilate, who is the Roman governor of, of that region, to, to authorize his execution by crucifixion. And as Pilate examines Jesus, there is a context for his question to Jesus. He asks Jesus whether or not he is king of the Jews. We may not realize at first glance, but this is a political question. Pilate is wondering what kind of political leader Jesus is. Pilate cannot tolerate threats to Roman rule, and there had been many uh, that had done this leading up to this moment. There had been a history of Jewish revolt against Rome and other powers. The Maccabean revolt actually against the Greek kingdom that was successful in uh, BC 164. Uh, that, that, that kind of thing cannot be tolerated against the Roman Empire. And so in Jesus' time, there had also been Galilean revolts uh, in 6 BC for taxation. After the time of Jesus, revolts continued and it eventually 
culminated in Rome uh, lashing back at these Jewish revolts, and uh, the temple was destroyed in AD 70. Pilate had been involved himself in brutal suppressions of Galilean uprisings and riots in the past. In the context of Matthew 18 as well, Pilate himself had arrested a man named Barabbas, who was an insurrectionist, a religious zealot who wanted to overthrow Rome, and he was also guilty of murder in this context. So Pilate wants to know, what kind of king are you, Jesus? Do I need to worry about you, that you're going to overthrow Rome and me? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from this world. Some have understood Jesus' words here to mean that he simply wants to set up a spiritual kingdom, a kingdom that has not much to do with the world's systems around us. In other words, uh, some understand Jesus to say, like, don't engage in any kind of political anything, public life. Don't engage in that. That stuff's worldly, right? There's God's kingdom over here, and it's separate. It's a a separate kind of thing. Uh, Some of the the Christians who really took this seriously, actually, are, uh, so our denomination is called Mennonite Brethren, and we are a subset of a, a larger movement That was called the Anabaptist movement. And this happened 500 years ago during the Reformation. And there's a lot that we have to thank uh, for the early Anabaptists because basically uh, the church and the state were kind of one entity in that time. And it was the early Anabaptists who really were the first ones to argue like the church and the state are are separate entities. And the the state should not have governance over uh, official church matters. It led to all kinds of horrible atrocities and things like that. And so they began to push back on those things. Um, And they separated. They wanted those powers separated. And we see over history, it took a long time for that to happen. Um, But then we also see where the Anabaptist movement maybe went like really, really far. Uh, We can think of like old colony Mennonites or the Amish who live in Pennsylvania Right? They took it so far to be like, the kingdom of God has nothing to do with the world. Right, We are going to go flee to the hills and go churn butter and ride horse and buggies. And that's how we're going to live. And so are they right? I mean, is that, is that what Jesus is saying by my kingdom is not of this world? Notice Jesus does not say my kingdom is not in this world. He says it is not of this world. He's speaking about the source or the origin or the nature or the way of his kingdom. Jesus' kingdom is otherworldly. Its character is different. It operates by different values and rules than the kingdoms of the world. Jesus had just prayed earlier in, in chapter 17 that his followers not leave the world. He doesn't want that for them, but to be in it, but not of it. Jesus does not deny that he is a king either. He says, my kingdom. He's telling Pilate he, that he poses no violent threat, though, because his kingdom is of a different nature. And then he tells Pilate that his kingdom is built on truth. He has come to bear witness to the truth. To Ultimately, this will lead to his death, to the death of of him and then his followers as well will follow in his footsteps in the years to come as the church is built. We are to sacrifice. It's a kingdom of sacrifice, not of us killing others. As Christians then who are called to imitate Jesus, we ought not do political engagement and public life in the ways of the world. God's people over the centuries have to reckon with uh, they've had to reckon with many different governing systems, many different kind of political powers. Uh, in, in, and there's a helpful little uh, summary of this. Jonathan or Joshua Chatra and Karen Swallow Pryor in their book, uh, Cultural Engagement, give us a good summary of kind of what this looked like. They said the relationship of the church to the polis is varied and unclear because the history of the church to the state in which it finds itself is as varied as the governments that have existed throughout human history. The first century church emerged within a society in which being a Christian could be perceived as treasonous and illicit. Just a few centuries later, the situation was reversed. 
when Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. From the two poles of this dialectic eventually emerged the American experiment. This is a very American kind of thing, right? Include Canada in that. Founded on ostensibly Judeo-Christian principles, key among them being religious liberty and unalienable rights. Charter of Rights and Freedoms. We can think of that in a Canadian context. Clearly, the relationship of the church to politics depends on the time, the place, and the society in which members find themselves. Even so, biblical principles concerning the Christian citizenship in this world and the kingdom of God are unchanging, though application of those principles has been understood in various ways. It's helpful. Uh, Jesus sets up this paradigm for us, though, in this text. It's like, look, there's the ways of the world, and there's the ways of my kingdom. And as we look throughout church history, what we're reading here is that Christians have had to reckon with this in different ways. And sometimes they've been really faithful. And sometimes they haven't been. And so we want to look into our time. What are some signs of political idolatry today? And we want to kind of borrow from biblical history as well as church history uh, to look at our time and to help us see ourselves. And then we're going to look at what it looks like in the way of Jesus. So signs of political idolatry or what we could call worldly politics. Um, Let's just talk quickly about an idol. What is an idol? Uh, an idol is, is anything that we place as our highest allegiance in life. It's the thing that, that drives our life. It's where we put our hopes and our dreams. The very center of our identity and our, our allegiance is to this thing. Most of us would not come forward and be like, yeah, you know what? I worship politics. I worship that political leader. But I think it would be um, naive for us to think that this is not happening. We are seeing it in our day. What are the signs of it? Uh, to be clear, we're talking about faith deconstruction. And so what we're looking at here are signs of how Christians make this an idol. How we in the church have political idols. So I'll start with one. Partisanship and tribalism. Uh, my wife and I, we went and traveled to Europe a number of years ago, um, almost a couple decades ago now. And uh, when we're getting, you know, you're traveling on the train or things like that, most of the people around you speak a different language. And so you feel very, like, not at home and very lost. And it's not like a comfortable feeling. So when you meet somebody who speaks English, you're like, where are you from? Right? Like, yeah, oh, sometimes you meet Canadians. A lot of times you meet Americans. But it's, it's oh, that's close. That's close. Okay. Like, we, we, hey, let's talk. So we met this one young couple one time and they introduced themselves to us and they said, yeah, we're from Iowa and we're Democrats. <laughs> and that, that was like in their introduction of like who they were. And we were like, oh, okay. Well, we're from Canada and we don't talk that way there. <laughs> uh, now that was a couple decades ago. I think Things have been changing, though, even for us, right? Maybe we learned some of this from our neighbors to the south, but if you look at studies, they say extremism and, and political extremism is on the rise in Canada. Uh, but there's this partisan, tribal spirit, right? There's the, it's become the part of our very identity, right? I am this. Uh, one of the more humorous examples, though, of partisanship that we see in, in, is in debates. If you watch, like, uh, presidential debates or, or debates in the House of Commons or things like that, you see that uh, anytime a debate happens, the, the two parties walk away and they both feel that they won, right? <laughs> oh, who won? We won, right? And that, you see that partisanship, that, that sense of, like, we're the winners and we'll do whatever we can to win. And if you watch these things go on, whether it's House of Commons in Ottawa or, or wherever, uh, you see that basically here's the party's job. The party's job is to accentuate the positive aspects of your own party, to point out the flaws within the other party, and never admit that you have flaws. Many media outlets and journalism of today also is divided across these party lines. If you work in politics, or perhaps you're a lawyer, you realize this is part of the job. This is how the system is deliberately set up this way. This is how a democratic society works. It's not necessarily wrong. 
it's, it's better for us to debate than to fight with violence, right? That's why we have a democratic situation. But in our digital age, we have so much access to these political dramas. What effect does that have when we're drinking that in all the time, we're watching from the sidelines, and we're seeing this partisanship and this, this tribalism go on? We sit there and we're like, yeah, that guy. Yeah, that guy's making a lot of sense. We pick that side. Now it's like, those guys over there, who do they think they are? Those enemies, those bad guys. And we, we, we accentuate the positive, we downplay the negative. This kind of party spirit by its nature begins to distort truth. It is not that no truth is spoken, right? You, you critique a party, you might be critiquing real things that you see. But it's that you become blind to your own, your own things. The, the inability to critique, to self-critique, distorts truth. It is interesting that Jesus tells Pilate his kingdom is about truth. Pilate, like so many politicians throughout history, balks at Jesus' claim of truth. His question, what is truth, is not genuine. It is a mocking response to truth. There's no such, <laughs> there's no such thing as truth, right? That's not possible. There's just your truth and my truth. Jesus himself, though, says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. The church is called the pillar and the buttress of the truth, 1 Timothy 3.15. So truth is vital to the core of who we are as followers of Christ. This isn't just truth that we find in the Bible. It's all truth. All truth is God's truth. But hyper-partisanship, tribal thinking, will not lead us to truth. Don't get me wrong, it's not wrong to have affiliations, associations. It's not even wrong to have a party or a tribe that you're a part of. The question, though, is, is it just all about winning? Does truth factor in? Are you willing to concede when the other party has a good point? You say, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. No, that's good. Or is it just win at all costs? That kind of thing is called tribalism. And it might be a sign we have an idol. Secondly, conspiratorial obsession. Lifeway Research surveyed a number of pastors in 2021 and said that 49% of pastors were concerned that members in their congregations were advancing conspiracy theories. Uh, God warned his people against conspiracy theories. In the time of Isaiah, uh, he said, don't be taken in by these things. He said in Isaiah 8, 12, do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. And do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread, but the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Uh, it was God's very people that were being taken in by conspiracies. That's the people that Isaiah is talking about. And they were spreading conspiracies. What exactly is a conspiracy theory? Uh, here's one definition. It's a mediocre Mel Gibson and Julia Roberts film. Just kidding, okay? It's a joke. Uh, actually, here's a, a definition by Miriam Webster. It's a theory that explains an event or a set of circumstances as the result of a secret plot by usually powerful conspirator. That's a, that's a mouthful. You could define it in different ways, I'm sure. Many times, though, a, a conspiracy theory is based on speculation, unfounded belief, hearsay, anecdotal information. And both the political right and the political left have been guilty of conspiratorial thinking. One example of this is anti-Semitic conspiracies that persist to this day. There are left-wing and right-wing versions of such anti-Semitic conspiracies. When Christians take part in this kind of culture, believing in lies, in half-truths, in unfounded claims, spreading them. We betray the way of Jesus' kingdom, which is to be people of truth. Someone says something to you, you can't really prove it. Well, like, I, I don't know. <laughs> if you can't prove it, then we don't, really know. we don't need to focus on it. 
Most of this is fueled by a lack of trust. We have a lack of trust today in institutions. If you, if you look at institutions across the board, whether it's medical institutions, government, church, um, schools, the, the, the trust that we have in our institutions is at an all-time low. And so what often we do is we reach for alternate sources of information, things that sound good to us. Hey, I like that guy. I like how, how he reasons. I like how he argues. And Paul warned us, though. And he warned the Colossian church. He said, beware of fine-sounding arguments. Might sound good. Is it in the way of Jesus? A third, moral bankruptcy. Another sign of political idolatry is the the sort of bad behavior that we see both in political leaders, but also in ourselves who follow them and how we sort of make excuses for those things in a way that I don't think Christians did in our culture um, not that long ago. We used to say things like, character matters. And in the last number of years, we make excuses for immoral behavior in candidates or even in ourselves, excusing violence and hatred, sexual deviance, lying, crass, hateful language. One thing I think uh, needs to be made clear is that character is visible. It's, It's visibly seen. Uh, when Paul tells Timothy what to look for for elders in the church, tells them to look for a list of character qualities, and they are visible qualities. They can be tested. They can be seen. Yet many have been turned off from Jesus because the ways that Christians have begun to excuse bad behavior, bad character. Having said that, we should also care about morally upright policies. If Christians excuse or dismiss blatantly unjust policies, that's also of concern. But here's where the, there's a big challenge for us as believers in our time. We live in a democratic society. We're given the right to vote. That's a, that's a right that I think I'm very thankful for, and I think most of us are. Uh, we have to keep in mind, though, there's many factors that go into someone's decision of who to vote for. And I can almost guarantee you that most people do not support every single policy that they vote for in a candidate. So you support a candidate, you probably still don't agree with everything about that candidate. Because there's so much nuance. And voting is a brutal, unnuanced system. It just is. If you interviewed 100 different people of why they supported that person, you'd probably get 100 different answers. So we have to slow down. We shouldn't jump to conclusions and accuse each other of things. You voted that. How dare you? How could a Christian do that? Part of our moral integrity is how we treat each other and with people with whom we disagree. But sadly, far too often, we're seeing Christians denigrate each other over political differences, even breaking up families over politics. Politics that important to us? Break up your family? Thanks, Isaac. This is a warning sign. Something else might become our God rather than Christ. Fourth thing, revolutionary extremism. Jesus uh, could not be more clear in John 18. His kingdom is not of this world, and therefore, it is not a violent threat to Rome. Yet not only is Jesus clear that he poses no violent threat, but listen to what Paul says in uh, his letter to the Romans of how God ordains government. He says this in Romans 13.1, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. Those who exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. Those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good. You will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the evildoer, on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. Sorry, you guys. The authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. 
Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. That's a different way of life. Of course, many of us read this and we right away want to get to the exceptions, right? There are some exceptions. There are exceptions. But I just want to encourage us not to just quickly go there because when Paul is saying this, he is saying this to a church that lives under the rule of Emperor Nero, who is a persecutor of the church. This is counterintuitive stuff. William Wilberforce, a Christian uh, politician in the British Empire in the late 18th and early 19th century, uh, was instrumental in abolishing the slave trade in Britain. He was a great man, a great example of a political uh, Christian leader in church history. There were times in Wilberforce's uh, fight for abolition that he, he even had some of his own supporters uh, encourage him to, to finally give in and, and, and fight and, and create revolution in Britain, just like the French had done. Wilberforce, though, refused. He would not become a revolutionary. He would always be an advocate for reform, but not violent overthrow. And yet there are many voices, a growing number of voices in the church today that are calling for a justification of violence in a revolutionary fashion to overthrow governments, even setting up a Christian nation, things like that. This kind of extremism, though, must be rejected. Christianity is never advanced through force, but through the hard work of persuasion. It's getting very extreme. I remember when I was a kid, how boring politics was, right? It was just boring stuff. Maybe we need a new movement, guys. Hashtag make politics boring again. I think that would be good. Lastly, hope in men. And what I mean by men is, is mortals. Uh, when we put our, our hope in mere men, mere mortals, we, we might be guilty of political idolatry. And th- there's a clear example of this in the Old Testament. It's maybe one of the clearest examples is when God's people, they, they ask for a king, uh, during um, the time of the judges. And uh, they came to Samuel, their judge, and here's what they said. It said, all the, all the elders of Israel gathered together, and they came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, behold, you are old. What a great way to start conversation. <laughs> behold, you are old. Your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us. Listen to their reason like all the nations that are around us. We want to be like them. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. Eventually, God says, hey, no, like, hey, give them what they want. It ends up being a really bad king, King Saul. Um, it wasn't necessarily wrong that they asked for a king. It was how they did it. It was the motivations that led them there. They wanted to be like the nations around them. Those guys got the political thing figured out. They wanted the ways of the world. They were not satisfied. They were not happy with God as their king. One of the tells in our modern politics of this kind of uh, hope in in men is that um, when when our candidate gets elected, we think everything's going to be amazing. Utopia will be ushered in and... And then if they don't get elected, we, we panic and we fear. What's going to happen? Where's our hope? We have a king. We even have a king who became human in the person of Jesus. We have a human and divine king who reigns over it all. Political leaders will come and go, but we have a king who has remained through the centuries and he will be here after election day. Why do we turn to idols? What's the motivations of our heart that lead us to, to move toward idols? Some of us might be watching this stuff going on in our society and you think, like, man, what's wrong with people? Like, why do they, why do, they do this? Maybe even hatred fills your own heart. I can't believe it. And, and why somebody would, would have a political idol like that? Maybe you even begin to hate one of your brothers and sisters in Christ because of this. 
The reality is we have to understand there's some deeper things going on. There is deep sin, for sure. There, there's pride often, but there's also brokenness. There's a lot of people who have been hurt by bad systems. There's people who are, are lonely and they are struggling with health or finances. They're looking for a leader who can provide them with basic needs as well as meaning and purpose and community. And this is why if the church would act the way that it should, much of the political polarization and heat would get turned down. Because that's what the church is supposed to be, a community under our king, where we have meaning and we have purpose and we all have roles. And politics does not need to fill that vacuum. Yet political engagement does still matter. You might be hearing all that and going, okay, well, maybe the Amish were right. Maybe we should just (laughs) go churn butter in the hills, right? Maybe that's the solution. And I want to say, like, no, like, the Lord has placed us here. This is your city. This is where you live. This is where I live. We have a public role to play, and it still matters. So how do we do it in the way of Jesus? How do we construct beautiful political engagement? Firstly, um, a commitment to Christ as king. Uh, There's a fascinating story in the book of Joshua. Joshua is about to head into the promised land. And uh, he encounters an angelic commander. Here's what it says in Joshua 5, 13. Joshua was by Jericho. He lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Are you for our tribe or for their tribe? He said, No. No. Think about that for a sec. Uh, That's not, uh, did you hear the question? (laughs) No. Some translations say neither. Not for either of you. That's, that's That's not the point. I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and he worshiped. He said to him, what does my Lord say to his servants? This commander comes and rearranges Joshua's posture. You're asking the wrong question. Do you worship King Jesus? That's the first question. Is he your king? He's not playing tribal wars here. That's not what this is about, Joshua. In fact, he's going to find that out very soon. As they go into Jericho, there's a lady there. She's a Canaanite. And she joins them. If it were just about tribes, like it would be like, no, they're all wasted. They're all gone. But Rahab becomes one of them. And she even becomes part of the family line of the Messiah later. If we have strict party lines and tribal identity in which the people who vote for this candidate are Christians and, and those who don't are not Christians, we've missed the point. Our identity cannot first and foremost be in such things. Again, this doesn't mean we can't vote for a particular party. Vote your conscience. It does not mean you can't work for a particular party. Or if you feel like, man, they represent good government or they have good policy, but, but just go in with your eyes wide open, right? You serve King Jesus. He's your king. Uh, Tim Keller tells a, a really interesting story about this. Um, he says, once I heard from a friend about a man from Mississippi who was very conservative in every way. He was a conservative Republican. He was also a very traditional Presbyterian. He had long wanted to visit Scotland, the homeland of American Presbyterians. Eventually, he arranged to serve for a month as a worker in a little Presbyterian congregation in a village in the Scottish Highlands. The church and its people were as conservative as he expected. They were extremely strict in their observance of the Sabbath. No one so much as turned the television on on Sundays. However, One day, he got into a discussion with several of his admired Scottish Christian friends, and he discovered to his shock that they were all, in his view, socialists. That is, their understanding of tax structure and government economic policy was very left-wing. He couldn't believe it. He had firmly believed that To be conservative theologically meant you were conservative politically on every issue. He spoke long with them. He came to learn that their understanding of the role of government was grounded in their Christian convictions. 
The man came home to the U.S. not only, not any more politically liberal than when he had left, but in his words, he was humbled and chastened. He realized that thoughtful Christians, all trying to obey God's call, can reasonably appear at a number of different places in the political spectrum with loyalties to different political parties. All right, enough said. Second thing, seeking our neighbor's welfare. That's another way to engage beautifully in reconstructing faith. Uh, When the people of Israel were taken into Babylon, they lost all their political power. They were captives in a foreign land. And uh, what, what would we do in that situation? Maybe fight back, maybe try to get away, try to flee. Jeremiah wrote a letter to these exiles, and here's what he said. He said, no, no, don't do that. Build houses. Live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Churn butter. Just kidding. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there, do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. I know there's lots of great and good Christians in this city who have made this city better and do so every day. I know there's many of them right here in this room. And you are to be commended for that. But this is the call, is to live lives of blessing right here, not flee, not fight back, but to live lives of blessing that we would be a blessing to our neighbors. Uh, This ought to be the heartbeat that we have, the motivation that we have to get involved in political or public or civic life is that we want to seek the good of our city, the common good of our neighbors. Maybe you don't see your engagement in your city as being political, but in many ways it might be the best kind of political engagement. Whether you're teacher, mechanic, doctor, farmer, or you work at McDonald's, you have a public role in this city. And while you do it, pray for those around you. Pray for your leaders. Be informed, vote your conscience, pray for the good of your city. Thirdly, honor authorities, honoring authorities. 1 Peter 2.17 says, Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. We see this in the life of Paul in the book of Acts. He was actually given opportunity to stand in front of rulers as well, just like Jesus. He got a chance to talk to King Agrippa. And uh, here's what we read in Acts 26. So Agrippa said to Paul, listen, listen to how Paul addresses him. Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. And then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I am going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and the controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. It's very respectful. He's bold. He asks for permission uh, to to speak in front of this king, to, to, to say what's on his heart. But he starts by commending King Agrippa for the good things that he sees in him. Is that our discourse? That's the way of the kingdom. This is what Paul spoke like. This is what we're called to speak like, is to speak with honor. This is the kind of character that we have, and it will look beautiful. It will look otherworldly and attractive to those around us. It will give us an audience with them. This leads into, uh, in the same passage here, our, our fourth point, evangelism. As Paul has a chance to speak in front of this king, and, to, and he asks, hey, I'm going I'm to speak to you. Do you know what he talks about? I mean, what would you talk about? Well, if you had a chance to talk to Trudeau, or your local MP, or your, your local mayor, what would you say? Would you lobby for something? Would you, uh, this issue over here? Those wouldn't be wrong. Wouldn't be wrong. But this is where the Bible messes with us. Because what does Paul say? He tells his testimony. And then, uh, here's what happened. The ruler Festus, who was there, responds to Paul. As he was saying these things, this is uh, verse 24. As he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. 
Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I'm not out of my mind. Most excellent Festus, again, very respectful. But I'm speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I'm persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? (laughs) He's after Agrippa's soul. He's telling him about Jesus. That's front of mind for Paul. Is it front of mind for us? Look, a lot has been said. Um, Maybe we'll land the plane this way. Um, Jesus had 12 disciples. And he prayed deliberately about who he would choose to be his 12. He spent all night in prayer. And he chose to follow him, to be part of his 12, Simon the Zealot, who wanted to overthrow Rome, and Matthew the tax collector, who was in Rome's pocket. These two men would have hated each other. They were on opposite sides of the political spectrum. And yet Jesus invited both men to be his disciples and to call them to a different way, the way of the kingdom. And ultimately, Jesus was enthroned as king. He was handed over. He was enthroned. His cross was was depicted as an enthronement. He took on the sins of the world, your sins, my sins, so that any who believe in him might not perish but have everlasting life. He's our king. Amen? Let's pray. Uh, Lord Jesus, we are, are so thankful, we're so grateful that we have such a king as you. You are good. You are full of love. You are full of truth. Uh, we can trust you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that um, no matter what happens in this world and, and the dark things that happen, God, would you use us to bring light to our city, to our province, to our country, online? Lord, help us to be a light. Help us, Lord, Uh, Give us wisdom, Lord, for for those who are here today who maybe are involved, um, particularly in in this world. Lord, we pray for great wisdom for them. We pray for uh, the character of Christ to manifest in them. Jesus, we uh, are thankful and we are hopeful that no matter what happens, we will always have you and nothing can take you away from us. So we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.